the our final day of the school and we begin with uh, Oliver Schlotterer who will resume the second lecture on string Gamble. Thanks uh, Oli. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction and uh, thanks to all of you for coming back. Yeah, so today is the continuation of uh, Tuesday's opening lecture on string amplitudes. And uh, as you noticed, I accelerated a bit at the end to put some uh, pieces on formalism on the blackboard. This was the beginning of the hands-on part where we would go with some explicit calculations, facing you with a couple of CFT ingredients. And uh, you were also invited to uh, do some things at home. Don't worry if you haven't done it. Um, this was just an optional homework um, where you can see these things in more detail. But it's also fine if you just uh, swim along and trust me about a certain claims uh, here and there. So I was giving you at the end of last lecture the world shift action of the bosonic string theory. So this uh, world shift action will be uh, the engine to compute uh, scattering amplitudes. And uh, in contrast to what you know from uh, QFT Feynman rules, here we are doing some quantum field theory on the world sheet. So this is a two-dimensional action, which you can view as a gauge-fixed version of computing the world sheet area. And uh, it will be by a correlation function with respect to this action that we de determine the integrands for string amplitudes, the integrand with respect to the moduli space of functional Riemann surfaces. Yeah, so accordingly, um, the first goal in the beginning of this lecture will be to compute correlation functions with this action. Correlation functions of what? We will look at the embedding coordinates um, of the, the string. Here, this is a vector with respect to target space. Here, these indices mu run from 0 all the way to d minus 1, just Minkowski space time. But from the world sheet perspective, with respect to this two dimensional uh, coordinate uh, z and z bar, this is a scalar. It's a world sheet scalar. Okay? And um, in order to compute correlation functions from this uh, free action, which is quite radical to field, we have the luxury that we can just recapitulate Gaussian integrals, which, for instance, determines the two-point function for you as the inverse of the kinetic operator. So here is the Green's function for the kinetic operator del del bar. This is the two-point function. And uh, what we will need for amplitudes is uh, higher point correlation functions. So uh, to get from here to higher multiplicity, this is just a matter of combinatorics, patiently doing all the big contractions. So, uh, as a first application of that big program, we compute the correlator of exponentials. So, as you will see, that field x should uh, better appear in the exponent or with the derivative in order to be a conformal primary. So, in some sense, these exponentials are even better behaved than the x itself. So uh, this correlator will be pretty ubiquitous. We will see it everywhere. That's why I, why I dare to give it a nickname, Kovalevsky factor. And here's the shorthand IN for that Kovalevsky factor. So this guy will be really important to, for instance, uh, determine the monotomies and the poles for uh, the string amplitudes. I think you will see at the course of today what I mean by that. So let's uh, all the time keep an eye on that Kovalevsky factor. And in the simplest examples of tree-level amplitudes, uh, you will have even more stuff in the correlation function. There's usually a combination of plane waves, but also some insertions of del x. But no problem, as soon as you uh, keep track of all the big contractions, you will find that, first of all, you can always factor out the Kovalevsky factor. And secondly, well, these extra fields, they just give you a very finite number of possible big contractions. You can do, for instance, this one, resulting in a double pole term. Um, as I was saying last time, here this no-name del is just this holomorphic derivative, and this commutes with taking the two-point function. So this is just the double derivative of the norm. And uh, yeah, the other class of terms that you see in this example, this is uh, from the situation when uh, these dx's contract against the plane waves. And here, this just uh, amounts to peeling off the space-time momentum up there. Yeah. Uh, here are a couple of places where I'm a bit sloppy or lazy. First of all, I do not carry around the momentum-conserving delta function, which is, strictly speaking, part of the correlator here. And I'm also too lazy to take care of the normal ordering colons. 
as you can probably imagine, when you do the blue contractions here, you want to better avoid that the denominator blows up. And uh, excluding that uh, term where the denominator blows up is just another way of saying that these dx's are normal order with respect to the exponentials at the same point. Yeah, so this finishes the recap. Um, there will soon be a point where I mention the super ghost pictures, maybe in 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, before I forget later on, let me already give a reference here. Because uh, when the super ghost pictures come up in this lecture, I will be glossing over most of the subtle details. And if you want to see what's really going on, it's better if you consult textbooks or uh, this document here, which is my thesis, which you can find uh, on the server of the LMU Munich. Okay, any general questions before I uh, start with the new material? All right, uh, we have taken a first look on uh, how, how to compute correlation functions. Let's now get closer to amplitudes. Let me now introduce uh, the so-called vertex operators. These are the specific combinations of uh, x that insert an open string state onto the world sheet. Okay, um, before committing to gluons, let me give a general remark on uh, how to insert arbitrary st string states onto the world sheet. Let phi be a placeholder for any open string excitation, massless or massive. And the way how all of this can be uh, reconciled with this uh, world sheet setup is it should preserve the symmetries of the world sheet action. There's a conformal symmetry to this action here, and uh, this is something we really, really need, for instance, to decouple negative norm states. And uh, if we want to insert some extra states on the world sheet, we should make sure that all of this is compatible with that conformal symmetry. So accordingly, state insertions are constructed from, from conformally invariant deformations of the action. So what can we add to the bosonic string action while preserving the formal symmetry? And uh, here is a piece of uh, intuition that enters from the pictures you saw on Tuesday. Open string states should better dock on on the boundary of the world sheet. So I won't write a d square z now, but just a dz going over the boundary of the world sheet. Okay, how did we get from formal symmetry up there? Uh, it was about the interplay of d square z and the holomorphic anti-holomorphic derivatives. So how can I get this one uh, to be uh, conformal? I must put something next to it that transforms like a d by dz. And in CFT terms, transforming like d by dz means it should better be a conformal primary of conformal weight 1. Uh, Please don't worry too much if you haven't heard this before. Uh, let's just say from the CFT perspective, these uh, fields that represent state insertions, they are quite severely constrained by the requirement of preserving conformal symmetry. And you will see a specific application in a minute. OK, so this guy is called vertex operator. It is the field equivalent of a string state a field on the world sheet, and as I just said, it must be a conformal primary of uh, weight 1, which just means uh, that it transforms like d by dz and a holomorphic change of coordinates. OK, so this is the general um, selection rule for um, what admissible vertex operators are. So this is the setup which you can use to construct the bosonic string spectrum. And uh, right now, I want to focus on the massless solution. 
to this uh, conformal primary constraint. What is uh, the master solution where k squared equals zero? Um, you can check that this exponential carries conformal weight, which is proportional to k squared. So if I decide to look at the master sector, this one won't contribute any conformal weight. And instead, we can construct the master surface operator by the following construction. Here is a play wave which has no conformal weight in the master's case, but we already noticed that d by dz has a good uh, transformation behavior. So, it is something proportional to del x. So this is a good ansatz, this is quite a promising candidate to get conformal weight one. Uh, now we have to do something about the free vector index that's just contracted with something. Okay, and to already give the spoiler, this uh, something here, this will be the polarization vector of a, a non-abelian gauge boson. So here, my claim is that this is the special case of the vertex operator where the open string states phi is, uh, is a glue. And here, this uh, j, it's simply taking a hat that we will have many gluons in the correlator. So this is just counting, this is the j gluon. Participated, uh, participating in the scattering process. Okay, so here this is a vertex operator depending on the world shift position, of course. And uh, yeah, some further data to specify it. I need a momentum. And also I need a polarization vector simply to make sure that all the space-time indices are soaked up. Okay, and uh, let me justify further why it's uh, reasonable to call this a gluon vertex operator. <laughs> this uh, vector epsilon here, um, it can't be anything. If you work out the conformal transformation properties, you will find that there's an obstruction to being a uh, conformal primary. There's an obstruction proportional to this one. Ah, sorry proportional to this dot product. So to make sure that it's really transforming in the correct way, you should uh, demand that uh, k dot epsilon is zero. That's something you hopefully know from quantum field theory. This is uh, a proper property of the physical polarization vectors of a gauge boson. Yeah. Okay, it's not obvious from what is on the blackboard that uh, this is an abstraction to conform the primary. We will see it in practical terms in a couple of minutes. Of course, you can alternatively work out the OPE with a stress tensor, but uh, I'll offer a more hands-on perspective in a couple of minutes. Okay, so these considerations based on conformal symmetry, they lead us to this transversality constraint that we know from gauge bosons. This is already a good hint that we are on the path of rediscovering gauge theories. Let me provide another piece of evidence. The next characteristic of uh, gauge bosons is that there should be some gauge invariants. And here, if we stare at an uh, external state with a polarization vector, then gauge freedom means anything I compute from here should be invariant under linearized gauge transformations, where the polarization vector is shifted by the momentum. So th this is just the momentum space version of adding a gradient field. Okay, adding a gradient, this is already the gauge transformation of Maxwell, and in Yang Mills, there's a commutator term on top of the gradient. But here, we are talking about an external state, about some asymptotic, uh, sorry, a linearized solution. So there, the commutator term doesn't matter. This is the linearized gauge transformation of Yang Mills. Okay, and let us now check whether this vertex operator respects the linearized uh, gauge transformation. So, what happens to the deformation of the action?
Suppose we do this uh, transformation to the polarization vector, which is given in the vertex operator. What do we get? Okay, so just imagine you replace this by k, then you have k times dx. But k dot dx is nothing but the z derivative of the exponent here. So if you replace epsilon by k, what you find is a total derivative. Yeah? So here it's important that we study the integral over the vertex operator, the deformation uh, of the action. Uh, you really need this integral sign to enforce that this is zero. So we are in a similar situation as in Claude's lecture. This is another place where surface terms don't matter. So by virtue of this uh, integration here, the linearized gauge transformation will just kill the vertex operator's contribution to the amplitude. So this uh, vertex operator here is compatible with the uh, linearized gauge invariance of the uh, young nodes. So that's, I would say, is the second uh, check mark. Yes, it's uh, really a good idea to sell this as a vertex operator that creates a gluon state. Uh, let me be a little bit more careful about uh, these uh, boundary terms here, uh, give you a better idea of why they don't contribute. So here, this is one of the places where the Kobanilsen factor is uh, strongly on our, on our side. This Kobanilsen factor up here uh, has the nice property that it will suppress any kind of surface terms. So, um, as you will see in a minute, any kind of uh, surface term will be of the type where some vertex operators collide. Uh, you saw these pictures, open string states entering somewhere in the boundary of the world sheet, and they are always in between some neighboring vertex operators. I mean, there's always a notion of cyclic ordering in the world sheet boundary. So, all kinds of surface terms which may come up uh, here, they are always of this form, where pairs of punctures collide. Now, how does the Kovalinsen factor behave in that area, in this um, corner of moduli space? Of course, there are plenty of factors here in uh, Kovalinsen, but if we look at a specific part <coughs> pair of colliding punctures, let's focus on the factor ZAD. Okay, so if this uh, factor downstairs uh, goes to zero, then uh, looks like we have on a good track. Raising it to a kinematic invariant looks like getting zero, doesn't it? Okay, it's maybe most obvious if the real part here is greater than zero. I guess if the real part is greater than zero, it's pretty obvious that this vanishes. But of course you could object now, what about negative real part? Doesn't it blow up? Well, okay, uh, point-wise it does indeed, but uh, here this is the place where we can do analytic continuation. Maybe some of you already got nervous when there were gamma functions on the blackboard on uh, Tuesday. So whenever the kinematic regime is not optimal, you can just do analytic continuation and use the same kind of vanishing theorem that was around when the real part was positive. You can do this because that factor vanishes for a sufficiently large range of SA. Yeah, so that's the background, and that's the reason why in the rest of this lecture boundary terms will always be dropped. In. Any question on this? Yeah, then it's uh, time to look at the tree level amplitude prescription. Let's now apply all of these ingredients.
let me start by the general case and write down an endpoint formula. And don't worry if things happen very fast. We will immediately jump to a three-point example. OK, so this is now about the endpoint, three amplitude of the open bosonic string. And uh, same disclaimer as last time. We'll only look at color stripped objects. So here, this is really a cyclic ordering. And it means we are looking at the coefficient of a given trace, where the chunk pattern factors are ordered in this uh, manner. OK, and uh, this is essentially a correlation function of uh, n vertex operators. So for each external gluon, one vertex operator. And um, according to the pictures we were drawing, you should make sure that the cyclic ordering is all right. And uh, here I'm already going to my favorite parametrization of the uh, relevant world sheet. This is about uh, world sheets of disk topology. And a good parametrization of the disk boundary is the real line. So all the integrations will happen right here. I want to have n vertex operators on the real line in a way that they preserve the cyclic ordering. That's why I'm putting here now a lot of inequalities. This is what belongs to the cyclic ordering. Yes, please. Um, is that complex? So, is that a real? Now they are re uh, restricted to the, to the real line, yes. Okay. And I'm indeed a bit uh, sloppy about this issue, uh, whether we are the closed string or the open string sector. I will uh, neglect factors of four that arise from the doubling trick when you obtain the open string greens function from the closed string greens function. There will be a place in the uh, next lecture where I tell you to rescale alpha prime. This reflects my carelessness about the doubling trick. But when they are on the action, they are complex, like the Z and the action is complex, the Z and the bar. And at which point I think I start thinking that is real? Uh, at, at that part, when you define your uh, open string right. vertex operator okay. or an open string state insertion to be an integral over the boundary of the world. Uh, okay. This is so where you restrict to, to real. Yeah, thanks for asking this. This is a really uh, subtle though important point. <clears throat> OK, so this is, uh, let's say, the, the first attempt to uh, write down a formula for endpoint tree amplitudes. But uh, now there's a little bit of overcounting going on. Um, since we insisted that the vertex operators are conformal primaries, their correlation functions depend on very few variables. So for the CFT experts, the two and three point functions, uh, they're completely fixed by conformal invariance, at least uh, as to their z dependence. So the only free data is uh, normalization of the two-point function and the structure constant of the three-point function. So the first time where there is some z-dependence in a correlator of conformal primaries is at four points. And this z-dependence from four points on, it enters through cross ratios. So strictly speaking, that n-point function, it only depends on n minus three cross ratios. But at the moment, there are n integrals here. That's overcounting. This is formally infinite, what I'm writing down here. So we must compensate for that. We must do a change of variables from the end punctures to the uh, cross ratios. So there must be a prescription to kill three integrations. And let me first of all give it a funny name and then explain what it is. So here, this uh, inverse volume of SO2R, this is a fancy way of saying we want to drop three integrals. We want to make sure that we only integrate over the cross ratios. And uh, if you're eager to start working with it as quickly as possible, then you can use the following cooking re recipe. Whoops. You would drop any three integrals. Some uh, triplet ZA, ZB, ZC. So you pick such a triplet and drop the integrals. And then you need to insert a compensating uh, Jacobian. Yeah, so this is essentially the Jacobian from the change of variables to cross ratio. And the funny thing is, here you have the freedom to pick any um, triplet 
of punches. It doesn't really matter whether you fix the first three vertex operators or the last three or some other choice. Yeah, you really have a hell lot of options. And um, another way of saying that this only depends on the cross ratios, there is a redundancy to this endpoint correlator given by Möbius transformations. Möbius transformations of the form that you map all the z's to alpha z plus beta divided by gamma z plus uh, delta, where alpha, beta, gamma, delta form an SL2 matrix. So of course, uh, this uh, ratio here is invariant in the rescaling of alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So you can always insist that the determinant is one. So um, if you want the A, Z, B, Z3 to take the three favorite values, then this is a unique SL2 transformation that you can always apply. And uh, as a practical um, result of this uh, application of Möbius invariance, you can choose, for instance, the fixed position is 0, 1, and infinity. As I said, you can take any three vertex operators, but to have a joint convention for this lecture, let's take uh, those guys, the first, the last, and the next to last punch. Yes, and let's look at the cleaned up version of this formula, where the uh, worry about infinite overcounting is manifestly gone. With this prescription and convention for the SL2 uh, fixing, our endpoint function simplifies in the following way. So one of the punctures is going to infinity, and uh, let me convince you that nothing will blow up in this uh, Zn goes to infinity limit. Okay, so first of all, uh, this integration over all these that are compatible with the disk ordering, this will specialize a little bit once we send uh, z1 to 0 and zn minus 1 to 1. So all the leftover integrals happen in a unit interval. Well, that's quite practical. Uh, it's good to have, uh, let's say, <laughs> finite integration ranges, and it's also beneficial in the sense that it connects with uh, Claude Duo's integrals from yesterday, where, for instance, multiple zeta values pop uh, out of these integrals over the unit interval. Okay, and then there is a vertex operator at zero, a vertex operator at one, and finally a vertex operator at Zn. But Zn is the guy that I want to send to infinity. Do we have any problems at infinity? Fortunately, no. Fortunately, this vertex operator is a conformal primary. And given that it has conformal weight 1, the asymptotics of that correlation function is um, like Zn to the minus 2. OK, let me be precise. It's the second line of that formula, which will asymptotically scale or fall off as the inverse square of the n. But in the first formula, we have this uh, Jacobi. So this is the compensating uh, fall off. In other words, that limit is well defined and finite. No problem about fixing a puncture to infinity. Sorry, the absolute finite square of Zn, where does it come from? Jacobian? Uh, this, 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 this Jacobian, yeah. So I guess you. 
just from undergraduate math lectures. There's a Jacobian and a change of integration variables. Okay, so it looks like uh, this is a sensible quantity to work with, and now it's really time for a, a three-point example to make all of these uh, things more intuitive. Okay, so here, this is particularly boring at three points. There is no integration at all to be done. So this is just an exercise of verifying that the correlation function um, is really independent on uh, the punctures. Okay, so now we are uh, in charge to compute a three-point correlation function of the vertex operator that you have seen before. So this is almost identical to the correlator we had on the blackboard at the beginning. Well, it has three in place of two insertions of del x, but uh, this doesn't alter the strategy. Okay, so um, from the correlators I stated before, this will for sure contain the Kobanielsen factor. And good news, since we are at three points, all the Mandelstam variables are zero by kinematics. There's momentum conservation, there is uh, the mass shell condition, k squared equal to zero. So there's no way uh, to build up a non-vanishing Mandelstam invariant at three points. The phase space is too small. And if all the Kobanielsen and exponents go to zero, then this guy is one. resolve the uh, different contributions that uh, arise from the uh, different bit contractions. As you have seen it before, we have the option to contract the axis among themselves, or we can contract them against the plane waves. So maybe let's start with the former. You can take a pair of these uh, the axes. They will contract to a Minkowski metric, and this will in turn contract the polarization vectors in the first one. But once you've contracted two out of three, you can't help that the third uh, dx will contract the exponentials. So this is where uh, the exponentials enter the game. And uh, this is a good moment to show you the need for the transversality constraint. So if we go slowly through the different uh, ways to contract an exponential, there is uh, this one, and there's uh, that one. Okay? But effectively, I can replace k2 by minus k1. This is momentum conservation plus a transversality. I mean, the K3 contribution contracts to zero against epsilon 3. So as a result, you get uh, Z dependence like that. And uh, let's compare this with the Z dependence we got from the dx dx term. So I hope that this example helps to convince you that uh, epsilon 3 should better be transversal. What we want is, by general CFT considerations, all the dependence on the punctures must go up. So there's the Jacobian upstairs, and we must get the corresponding denominators from the second line, from the dx correlator. 
Yeah, and by combining the two, you indeed get uh, just the Z12, Z13, Z23. By combining the two, you can convince yourself that the positions really drop out. So that's the reason why we don't even need to take the limits if 3 goes to infinity. The punctures drop out on the nose. Now, uh, do the combinatorics. Of course, there are several ways to do these contractions. I can choose any pair of 2D axes that I contract. That's why you would generate a cyclic orbit. And now, there's a second contribution. So, I could, when did you use it as a side I used it to go from epsilon 2. Dot, uh, sorry. I used it to replace uh, this one. By that. Mm -hmm. And now I see. this term will drop out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for asking. It's this one. So if you don't want to compute the OPE of the vertex operator with a stress tensor, but if you want to see it instead uh, happening in front of your eyes, this is the place where you find uh, transversality is a necessary condition to get a reasonable free amplitude. Um, okay, so here in that square bracket there were terms with a dx dx contraction, but of course I can instead contract all the dx's with the exponentials. I can take three copies of the blue terms. And uh, if you take three copies of the blue terms, the dependent